For the scripture reading this evening, we turn to the epistle to the Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. Romans 8, and the text this evening is verses 35 through 39, which we will not reread. This is the Word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inspired word, Romans chapter 8. May he bless the reading thereof unto our hearts. The text that we consider this evening is verses 35 through 39 of Romans 8, which we will not reread, but Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, from no condemnation in verse 1 to nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in verse 39. In this glorious chapter of Holy Scripture written by the inspiration of the Spirit and written by the hand of the Apostle Paul who himself knew about the persecution and about the distress and the tribulation and the peril and the sword and who himself knew about the principalities and the powers that were out to disrupt and put an end to his ministry. But the Apostle Paul here in this concluding section of this chapter, his heart throbbing with confidence, the note of victory sounding in his voice, perhaps his hand trembling as he pens this, arrives at this conclusion, which is the mountaintop, which is the the, the Mount Everest of, of a promise of God that nothing and no one shall or even can separate them that are in Christ Jesus from the love of God which is in him. This is a tremendous passage here that we consider this evening. It is a passage that the saints have drawn all manner of consolation from throughout the life of the church upon this earth fraught with trial and difficulty and affliction. And it is the word of God to you this evening, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote this not only for himself, not only for the church at Rome, but for the church of God throughout all ages. In particular, in this concluding section, a couple things. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul, having landed on that note glorified in verse 30, and having considered these things, he launches into these questions. And he takes us up with him in these, in these questions. And he has us asking these questions with him and answering these questions with him. And now they're put in the form of a question, but understand that, that it's more a, a rhetorical question. It's a question, the answer to which is obvious, that it need not even be stated. And that gives effect to the triumph and the victory of the question. He says in verse 33, uh, or in verse 31, who, if God be for us, who can be against us? The answer is no one. Not in the sense that the church doesn't have enemies, but in the sense of who can succeed in uh, their attacks against us? Who can prevail against us and overcome? Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's a challenge there. It's not an uncertain question with an uncertain answer, but it's a challenge. The answer is no one and nothing can condemn, for it is God that justifieth. 
And now the grand finale, uh, arriving now uh, in this epistle, finally explicitly to the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, if you reread this chapter, you may notice that that word love, God's love for us, this is the first time where it is explicitly said by the Apostle Paul. Now, to be sure, the chapter mentions love. We have that in verse 28. uh, All things work together for good to them that love God. That's the love of the believer for his God and Father in heaven. Now here in verses 35 and following, we have God's love for us. And that really is the, it's what it all comes down to. When it comes to the gift of Jesus Christ for our salvation, why? Why? When it comes to the glory that Jesus Christ won for us through his death and resurrection, why? The answer is not because of you, not because of me. The answer is because of this love that stretches from eternity towards eternity. And even though the Apostle Paul only now mentions it explicitly, it is this love of God that has been permeating this whole chapter from the no condemnation all the way to the nothing shall separate. And it's this love of God that we want to consider this morning. This love of God which is in Jesus Christ manifest in in the bleeding and the dying Savior for us that we want to consider and that we want to see this evening for our encouragement, for your consolation in the midst of your peril, tribulation, distress, whatever it may be, this promise of God here in the chapter The theme, therefore, inseparable from God's love. Noticing in the first place the meaning of this, that inseparability. Noticing in the second place the firm persuasion of it. It's remarkable. I am persuaded, the apostle says. A man who had stripes on his back and scars all over his body by reason of uh, suffering for Jesus' sake. And then finally, in the third place, the victorious conclusion in that expression, more than conquerors. Well, the meaning, the question, the rhetorical question, the answer just shouting out even as he says it, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And later on, that same love is described as the love of God in Jesus Christ. This is the love of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the love of God towards his people whom from all eternity he elected and set his love upon in Jesus Christ the Lord. So, it's not talking about our love for God. As we said earlier in the chapter, it talks about our love for God, which is the fruit of God's grace. But here now, it's God's love for us. As regards our love, for, our, our love towards God, it's, it's too unstable and, and too uh, changing uh, to lay any kind of foundation, uh, to be any kind of foundation uh, for our assurance. But here now, the love of God That's a foundation indeed. This is the love of Christ. This is the love wherein Jesus Christ came down from heaven for the salvation of His bride, His people lost and ruined by the fall. This is the love that John talks about the night that Jesus was was betrayed. Jesus Christ having loved His own, He loved them unto the end. This is the love that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. The love wherein Christ gave himself for us to redeem us and sanctify us and glorify us together with him. This is the love that Christ has for you, believer, even now in heaven at God's right hand. The love of Christ, which is, again, one and the same with the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's consider the love of God. We're going to be considering it again uh, throughout the sermon this evening. And one of the big things that we want to understand, and yet something so great, so unfathomable, that we'll never graduate from learning and knowing this aspect of God's love towards us. It is something that easily rolls off the tongue, and yet it is something that throughout our lives as Christians we grow in apprehending, which is this, 
that the love of God is unconditional. Unconditional love. Really, really unconditional. And what that means is that the love of God towards us, it it is not towards you and it's not towards me because of anything that you or I have done. It was not elicited by some virtue that God found in us as though God looked down from heaven and saw you and thought, well, now look at this one here. Look what he has done or look what he shall do. Therefore, I shall love him. God didn't set his love upon us because he thought that that we would do a pretty good job of loving him back or that we would do a pretty good job of living the Christian life. That's not why God loves us. God loves you, brothers and sisters, because he wants to. And therefore, from all eternity, God freely set his love upon his elect in Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that later. It's amazing. In the second place, God's love is a love with purpose. And this ties into that that word separate there. This is a love with purpose, verses 29 and 30. It is according to this love that God predestinated us to glory. According to this love, purposes the final, uh, the, the glorification of the church in the world to come with Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate destination that God marked out from all eternity in his counsel of election. And it's that purpose that God's love achieves towards them that are in Christ Jesus. It has this purpose, this working all things together for good and at last glorifying his church together with his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In addition, with respect to the love of God, this is a love that is operative, it's, a lo- it's not an idle love that doesn't do anything. It is a love that is active. It is a love that does. That's evident from verse 28, or, or verse, uh, yeah, verse 28. All things work together for good, not on their own, but because God's hand rules, governs, and directs all things, and it's the, it's, it's the same God who loves his church for whom he works all things together for good. The activity, the fact that God's love is operative and that it does is also evident in verse 37. Notice there the past tense. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's a past tense verb, loved us. And the idea there is not that uh, God once loved us in the past and has ceased to love us now, but the idea is there was, this, there was something that happened in the past. Something so great, something so profound that stands as the permanent testimony and manifestation of God's love for us. And what is it? What is this event? What is this event that took place in time and history when God opens up his heart to our view and it's the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Therein is the love of God revealed. The question that the Apostle Paul takes up and issues in a challenge is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So what does that mean? What would that be, separation from God's love? Well, even when it comes to human love, the love that human beings have towards each other, in the earthly relationship, To become separated from someone's love or for someone to separate his or her love from you is one of the hardest experiences uh, that a human being uh, can experience in this life. This separation from love. It's one of the heaviest blows that someone can experience. There's a reason that it's called a broken heart. It doesn't get much deeper than that, does it? A broken heart. The heart which is the center, the deepest recess of our existence. But that's what what it does to us when there is that uh, separation from or that that breaking of human love. Well, what about God's love? Who shall separate us from the love of God? As regards the meaning of that word separate, 
the idea there would be for something to come between you and between God's love such that that love is no longer able to manifest itself towards you, such that that love is no longer able to reach you and, and, and uh, have its effect and, and achieve its purpose? Is there anything, is it possible for anyone or anything to knock the believer out of the love of God so that he falls out of its reach and so that God's purpose is no longer achieved towards his child? Now, what's the answer? The answer is given in verse 39. But let's consider what the answer is not. The Word of God does not say here, who, who, can, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It doesn't say that there are no things or no people that are opposed to the Christian. It doesn't say that the Christian has no enemies. It doesn't say that there are, there, there's no force of evil that's out to undo the Christian and that wants to separate him from God's love. It does not say here that the Christian life is one of ease and that it's a stroll in the park without any suffering and tears and crying and weeping. In fact, the Word of God does not say here either this. It doesn't even say that there will be no times in the life of the child of God where he will doubt whether or not God loves him. Where he will be afraid that he has been separated from God's love. What does it say? It says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that nothing shall separate is in spite of that which is against us. It is even in spite of that which we feel and that which we experience because this is a promise that transcends our emotions, that transcends our feelings. It's the rock-solid Word of God for them that are in Christ Jesus. Let's consider uh, this challenge here and the items that the Apostle Paul lists in the text. come across a list like this in Scripture and we're familiar with God's Word and reading lists like this and one of the things we have to be careful about is against naively rattling off these things as though they were a light thing. There's a lot of heaviness in this list. And the first thing that we want to consider is persecution. And the Apostle Paul has his eye particularly on persecution in verses 35 and following. Verses 35 and 36. Tribulation, distress, persecution. And then in verse 36, he cites Psalm 44 where the church, the faithful church here, not being chastised by reason of their walking in sin, but the faithful church for God's sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, this word persecution is one of the hardest sufferings and hardest experiences that the Christian experiences in this life. And we have brothers and sisters right now who feel this very thing. And the idea here is when the way of the Christian is made narrow and tough, exceeding difficult, painful, by reason of Jesus Christ in whom he believes and in whom he wills to live godly. It's when someone suffers for righteousness' sake. Before we consider some examples of persecution throughout history, when Guido de Bray was in prison awaiting his execution, in the 1500s, he wrote a letter to his wife and he described his experience in the jail. He's in jail for Jesus' sake, for, because of the gospel that he preached. And he wrote a letter to his wife and he said to his wife, I am, he says, when, it, when you compare what I am experiencing now with what I counseled others when they were going through these things, 
He says, if you compare my experience now with what I told others, I realize now that when I spoke about this to others, I was talking about it as a blind man speaks of color. We begin with Psalm 44. Some say that that psalm was written at the time of the Maccabees. Now others say it wasn't at the time of the Maccabees. But the point is, we're going to use that example. We're going to consider the Maccabees because it's a fitting example of exactly what Psalm 44 describes. The Maccabees, 2nd century B.C., you have the, the Jews who have returned to Judea, God's covenant people. And then a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, as though he, evil incarnate, He comes down with his troops, with his Greeks, and he seeks to impose the Greek culture and the Greek way of life upon God's covenant people. And he forbids them from practicing uh, the law of Moses. He forbids parents from uh, circumcising their children. He forbids them from having the scriptures on pain of death. Now there were many that were faithless that gave in Uh, that defected and joined that anti-Christian cause, but there were many faithful. And there were men and there were women and there were children who were slaughtered because they would not profane God's holy covenant. So that if, uh, it was, if it was found out that this woman, say, had had her child circumcised, they'd kill her and the baby. It'd be like someone today... Parents being put to death together with the baby because it was found out that that baby was baptized in a church of Jesus Christ. But this is the history of the church. Hebrews chapter 11 at the end, the the heroes, uh, as as it said, the heroes of faith, and yet... uh, The writer of the Hebrews doesn't intend to put these on a pedestal above the church, but he says, these are our brothers and sisters here. We're in this together. And in Hebrews 11, 35 and following, he says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Our brothers and our sisters. Consider the persecution at the time of the Roman Empire in the days of Nero, who strapped, dipped Christians in pitch and strapped them to posts and lit them on fire for torches as that madman ran around in his chariot in his gardens. Think about the persecution in the time of the Netherlands. Uh, the, the, the Reformation, the, the, the gospel made inroads into the Netherlands. People are being delivered from the bondage, the tyranny of Rome. Uh, the church is gathered The true gospel is proclaimed. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of thousands of Christians were persecuted and put to death by the sword, by the Duke of Alva, who ruthlessly, mercilessly killed men and women and children. It didn't make a difference. Now that's real stuff there. It's almost like if you were to come home in that day, you'd be told about Uh, this friend or that friend, or this family member or that family member who was arrested and put in jail or beheaded or executed in some other way. Real relationships, real human beings suffering for Jesus' sake. And today, too, there are our brethren the world over who, who suffer in the same way for God's sake. People who are ostracized by friends or family because uh, of the religion that they, uh, that they affirm. People who are rejected by their parents or by their children. People who are put in jail. People who are persecuted by the society in which they live. Now what about that? Even that, the apostle says, can't do it. Cannot separate. Cannot frustrate the love of God towards us. 
when it comes to how we feel and how we experience and, and anxious and fearful and doubting thoughts, think about how hard it is for someone who's suffering for God's sake. It's the, it's the God, the same God who's, uh, who, who loves him and who promises, his, promises that believer his love. And yet it's for this God's sake that his life involves so much suffering and so much hardship. There's a reason the church needs this word. It's the answer to those doubts when it feels as though God is out against us or that God has forgotten us. The saints in Psalm 44, they told God, why are you sleeping? Wake up, deliver us. Even in that, nothing was able to separate them from God's love. Let's consider uh, further in this list the, the evils and the adversities of this life. Tribulation, the word there means that which presses down, that heavy trial that you feel pressed down uh, and your knees are weak uh, underneath it. Distress, there's someone confined whose way has been very narrow. A trial, for example, where you feel like it's a struggle even to breathe. Famine, we don't know what that's like. That's not just... Uh, a little hunger, but that is think in Lamentations when Jeremiah describes the children crying out to their parents for bread during the Babylonian siege. They are crying out, their stomachs are in pain, and the parents have no bread to give them. Nakedness, extreme deprivation, uh, destitution, peril, sword. Think about wartime. Not just World War II, World War I, the wars of the past, but think about the war in Ukraine right now. Now, it's easy for us in the United States to read the news and, uh, you know, sit in our armchairs with our politics and explain all of the whys and wherefores of, the, of what's going on in the Ukraine. Don't forget you have brothers and sisters for whom life is air raid sirens and bomb threats and missile threats who are this close to death via a rogue missile or a surprise attack every day. What about that? Verse 39, the catalog picks up there, death. Now there's a reason that's first in verse 38. The Apostle Paul himself calls it the last enemy. And under that umbrella that is called death is not only the, the physical event of death, but under that umbrella of death is the sickness, the disease uh, that came into this world with the fall of man into sin. There in that word death is what the believing husband and wife with children uh, encounter when the doctor comes in after the scan and says to the wife, I'm afraid that we found something. With that heaviness in his voice where you know exactly what this is going to mean. Here and under this word death is the death of a loved one. The death of a, ch the death of a child. The casket being lowered into the earth with the family standing around it weeping. And this word death here is our own death one day when it's time for you and for me to die. And when we are the ones on the hospital bed or at home on the deathbed and the family and friends are gathered around us and we know that our time is short upon this earth and we prepare for death. What about that? What about life? The things that happen in this life, so much of which is evil and so much of which is hard. Consider in that word life, the, the circumstances of this life, things like broken relationships, the departure and the faith, faithlessness of, of a spouse or of a loved one. Think there in that word life, what life is like, say, for the child who's grown up in a broken home or whose parents are separated and who's, or, or who's never known the love of a father or of a mother. Angels, principalities, and powers, the, those uh, non-human, moral, rational beings, whether they be good or bad, whoever it is, all included, 
nor things present. The things that are going on right now in your life, the circumstances through which you are walking and the trial that you experience, there it is. Nor things to come. The future. How often do not our anxieties and worries have to do with the future? What's going to happen? What are things going to be like, you know, this amount of time away from now? Or worries and anxieties about the future with respect to our children or our grandchildren? You know, how are things going to be for them? If the world is this bad now, what's it going to be like when our children are grown up and they have a family? All these worries and anxieties that we load up upon ourselves as we mortals try to be sovereign and try to have it all planned out only to realize that we're not sovereign and that we can't see a day ahead and the future is so uncertain. Nor height, nor depth. This promise here, it spans all of time and it spans all of space. You can just see this circle widening out until at last every creature and everything under the sun is included here nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. And with that, he embraces it all, includes it all. If there's a creature, if there's a thing, if there's a trial, if there's an event, if there's a struggle that you don't see listed there, it's like, put it right there in that phrase, nor any other creature. And so the Apostle Paul, I mean, this is the mountaintop of faith here, the the triumph of victory. He ranges before the church everything except the good God in heaven himself and says nothing and no one shall be able to separate you and me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. As we said in the introduction, the Apostle Paul, you know, he wasn't writing this for himself only. And in this text, he's not just taken in the, the, the church at Rome. But this is the word of God for the church throughout all ages. And, and so, let us ask our, ourselves the question, what is it, child of God, that troubles you? And what is the trial or the distress or the tribulation or the ache or the agony that troubles you, brother? or that troubles you, sister. This text is for you. And what we find out in this text is that there's there's nothing too hard to be included in this promise. It's a word of God that really can handle it all. And and you'll never find something that's too big or too hard to be included in this nothing shall separate Now again, the text does not say that life will be free of trouble. It does not say that life will be free of pain and of crying and of hurt. The text does not say that we will never feel at a loss and not know what to do. The text does not say that we'll never have a time where we are full of fear and doubt and uncertainty about this trial through which we are passing. But it does say this, that no matter what, when, where, nothing shall be able to separate us from that love. And listen, if we have the love of God, and if the love of God is towards us, and nothing can knock us out from under it, and nothing can frustrate its purpose towards us, well, you have everything. All things are yours. Because you are the loved of God. And that's whose love we're talking about here. Before we consider the Apostle's firm persuasion, one question to consider is, can I or you separate myself or yourself from the love of God? So the question here concerns preservation in that love. The fifth head of the canons, the the preservation of the saints. That's right here in this word. Nothing is able to separate us. The question, can you separate yourself 
Or can I separate myself from it by my sin or unfaithfulness or disobedience or lack of love towards God? Now that question is not asked to give a license to sin. And if there's someone here who hears something like this and says, oh boy, uh, here we go. Uh, This means we can sin as we please and uh, no worries, everything will be all right. That's an unchristian attitude. That's not a Christian response to the promise of preservation and the promise of God's love. That is an attitude that ought to be repented of. Okay? We're not, ask, we're not asking this question to give a license to sin. We're asking this question out of a sober estimation of the human condition that we have. If we take seriously Lord's Day 52 when it says that we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment, out of, out of, a, out of that consideration, out of a sense of our own foolishness and blindness by nature and the unbelief that cleaves unto us and the unfaithfulness of our corruption. And there are some in the history of the church and uh, into the present who say yes, who say that it is possible for the believer, for someone who is in Jesus Christ, that it is possible for that one to separate himself by his unwillingness and by his apostasy. And thus, possible for that one to, uh, says this error, uh, possible for someone to frustrate God's love, make it fail of achieving its purpose, and perish in the end. Where is that in the text? Where, where is even the possibility of that Do you see how such a view as that guts this text and robs this text of its bedrock foundation? Look at verse 30. It says, Whom he justified, them he also glorified. It doesn't say there, whom he justified, maybe he also glorified, so long as these uh, uh, believers are willing uh, to be preserved. It says, whom he justified, them he glorified. No ifs, ands, or buts, period. Because this is God of whom we are speaking. Look at the text before us this evening. Any other creature, is the believer a creature? Is the believer a created thing? All right then. Well, he can't separate himself from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And what a comfort that is. What a comfort for the church of Jesus Christ to know that her Savior is is too strong than to let one of his sheep be plucked out of the hand of his Father. What a comfort for you and I to know, for you and me to know that even, even me, this wretched sinner in and of myself, we who still have this corruption, that we can't knock ourselves out of the love of God. In the second place, the firm persuasion. The firm persuasion of this that the apostle has. And that is, as we said in the introduction, remarkable. This is, and the apostle's convinced of it. This is, and he is convicted of it. He is assured of it. All right, so where does that come from? Well, this firm persuasion here, it's, it's got good ground. It's got, it's got this foundation upon which this persuasion is staked. And that ground in the first place, really, uh, everything we say in the second point all comes back to this. The love of God. It's because of whose love this is and what kind of love this is. That is the ground for the apostles' conviction of this nothing shall separate inseparable from God's love. You see, this is not the love of a creature. This is not the love of a a mere mortal human being. This is the love of God. And the Apostle Paul has a high view of God. You hear that word God come in in this this ending here. he, he, He speaks God's name and he has a high view of God's love. And that love in the first place is unconditional. Here we are again. Can't say enough of it. 
which means that it was not elicited by you or by me or something God found in us or thought he would find in us or expected to find in us. He didn't look down from heaven and see a reason to love us, to be found in ourselves. He set his love upon us because he wanted to, because it freely pleased him to do. And it was not elicited from all eternity, and it is not subject to, and it does not depend upon anything outside of God himself. It's very important. It means that not only do you not have to do anything to have this love, and to be worthy of this love, but you don't, your unworthiness can't make any less of it. And it doesn't make his love skip a beat. It means that God's love towards us does not rise or fall based upon how well we do, upon how well we perform in the Christian life. That's not how it works. It really is unconditional and it really is free. And it's knowing that through faith that fills our hearts with love for God himself. The second place God's love is unchanging As for our love, as for human love, there's a lot of change, there's a lot of variableness. But with respect to the love of God, there is neither variableness nor shadow of turning because this is the love of God who is immutable, who is unchanging, who is not like us, uh, inconstant, fickle, uncertain in our attitudes, in our thoughts, in our desires, but this is the love of God. That's comforting. Praise God for those times in your life uh, where you uh, feel love towards God. Uh, For those mountaintops that pop up in the Psalms when the psalmist extols God whom he loves. There are also the desert days. There are also the desert days in the Christian. The times where he hardly feels any love for God in his heart at all. And he mourns over it and he grieves over it. And he says to himself, I ought to love God so much more, but my love for God is this small. Well, even that smallness doesn't take away from the love of God. In the third place, God's love, unconditional, unchanging, it is unbreakable. Let's contrast that with human love. How many times uh, under the sun does not human love break? How many wedding rings that were given when the husband and the wife come together in marriage and they promise each other their constant faithfulness and abiding love, how many wedding rings have been ripped off the finger and thrown to the bottom of the sea or wherever else it may be? There's breakability there. But not divine love. It's it's love of a different kind. It cannot be broken. It cannot be frustrated. Its purpose cannot fail to be achieved because of the one whose love it is. Constant faithfulness and abiding love, that is the promise of God to all of them that believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And that is a promise that God keeps. He never takes the wedding ring off. He never takes the, the one that he's given us off either. Nothing shall separate us. And so it's the nature of the love that gives the apostle this firm foundation. He knows who this is. He knows what kind of love this is. And that allows him to be so categorical and so sweeping and so bold in his pronouncement that nothing shall separate us. And that love of God is a love that God has revealed towards us in the death of his son, Jesus Christ. So we may say no one knows God's love who doesn't know Jesus. No one knows God's love who doesn't know the bleeding and the dying Savior who hanged between criminals a couple thousand years ago outside the walls of Jerusalem because there in that event, the love of God is manifest and is revealed. It is the opening 
to view of the heart of God in a way that human reason would have least expected it, that God's love should be revealed in a dying man dying for sinners who could do nothing to save themselves. Now we bring this up under the second point, the firm persuasion of it. And an important distinction here, God's love for us is not because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. God's love for us, it does not, the ground of that love is not that Jesus died for us. What does John 3, verse 16 say? It doesn't say this. It doesn't say that God gave His only begotten Son in order that God might love again as though the Son had to twist the arm of the Father to get Him to love sinners. No, but what does John 3.16 say? And it says, For God so loved the world. And what a people. That world, according to the election of grace. Mankind, according to the election of grace, that ruined themselves by the fall. Guilty and corrupt people. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And now that's precisely it. The gift of the Son was because of God's eternal love, and therefore in the cross of Jesus Christ, God's love is manifest. Romans 5. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died not because we did anything to deserve it. The, as, a, as one uh, minister of old said, uh, it's not this way. Uh, live a good life, do the best you can, and then Jesus Christ died for you and you shall be saved. As though you have to do something to elicit uh, the death of Jesus Christ, why he should have died for me. No, in ourselves, ungodly sinners, the text says. And yet for such as us, Christ died because God loved us. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, he that loved his own son with a love far greater than Abraham loved Isaac as he stretched the knife above him. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Delivered him up even when it meant for God to hear his own son crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And why the sparing not? And why the delivering up? Because you deserved it? Because you had done something to elicit it? Because you were such a good person? No. Because of sheer, unconditional love that was not willing, believer, to let you perish. And love that purposed and love that achieved your salvation in the death of God's Son, in the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of eternal life. Now he that spared not his own son, who's the one that's going to separate you from that? He that delivered his own son to the bitter and shameful death of the cross, is there something or is there someone that's going to knock you out of that love? That's going to make that love fail to achieve its purpose at last of glorifying you with Christ? No, God's love is too strong and it's too great and it's too unconditional and it's too eternal and unchanging and unbreakable to let that happen. Firm persuasion of faith. The death of Jesus Christ, although not the ground of God's love for us, is the ground of the firm persuasion of God's love the ground of the assurance of God's love and the conviction of God's love. 
And that conviction and that assurance and that persuasion is faith. The apostle says this out of faith. Now you'll notice in Scripture there's a contrast that's drawn at times between faith and sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, 2 Corinthians. We look at the things, uh, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. So there's this contrast. I am persuaded, says Paul, and he says that not because of what he sees with his eyes. It's not something that arises out of sight because there may be times when it certainly doesn't look this way or it certainly doesn't appear this way that nothing shall separate us from God's love. Neither does this come out of feelings. This is not something that, he's, uh, that, that he arri uh, arrives at based on how he feels. There may be time when the feelings aren't there and it certainly doesn't feel this way. Neither does this conclusion and this confident shout arise out of his reason. There may be times when you can't figure it all out and you can't make sense of it and you can't put the pieces together. You think of Job of old, what happened to Job and, and now the love of God, to believe the love of God. There may be times when you can't figure it all out. This is faith here where you believe it even when you don't feel it and even when it doesn't appear to be that way, believe it anyway. Because this is God who speaks. And God's word is good. And there's not one person who's relied upon the word of God and who's trusted God's promise, who's ever come up short, or who's ever been disappointed in that in which he trusted. Feelings come, a poem says. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not else, is worth believing. And that word of God is sealed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And in those moments in your life, or maybe it's in the life of a brother or sister who's really struggling right here to believe this love, you can do no better than to direct that brother or sister or remember yourself, the man from Nazareth, God in the flesh, hanging on the cross, bleeding and dying because of love. There it's revealed. And there from arises this assurance of faith in what God did in Jesus Christ. The victorious conclusion. Briefly, now in the third place. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors over what? If, if you, uh, a victor has the victory over something, over what? Over sin, over death, over hell, over the devil, over the sufferings of this present age, over it all. And he doesn't just say victors, he says more than victors, more than conquerors, those who uh, completely, uh, prevailingly overcome. Now that victory is uh, we shall fully enjoy in the world to come. When Jesus brings out the crowns and welcomes us into the new heaven and the new earth, and we celebrate together in the victory that he won for us by his death and resurrection. Notice here that that word is in the present tense. We are more than conquerors right now which means that you Christian people in your lives are not in this and upon this earth or facing this trial or under this burden as them that are defeated but as them that are more than conquerors with the victory in hand that's glorious that's tremendous that means that you may boast in Jesus Christ even in the midst of that distress and that tribulation because all things are yours in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that these things that are against us, so much are you more than conqueror that they must work together for your good. And they must somehow, some way, maybe God only knows now, be subservient to your salvation because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that note, the Apostle Paul ends this wonderful chapter, an expression and a name he loves to say. The end of chapter 5, he ends with Jesus Christ our Lord. End of chapter 6, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Chapter 7, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, verse 39, the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He who was at the center of God's counsel from all eternity, and he with whom one day we shall be glorified, he because of whom we have salvation and the hope of glory in the world to come, he who won us this victory through his merits and sufferings and obedience, all according to the eternal and unchangeable and immutable love of God for you who believe in God's Son. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we give thee thanks for thy word, blessed unto our hearts, and assure us daily of thy love and favor that we may be of good courage in the midst of this present age that is fraught with suffering and trial and affliction. Hear our prayer, Father, and hear our cries, and answer us in thy mercy, and cause us to be firmly persuaded of this thy word through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.